Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done, going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is March 8th, 2018, and my guest is syndicated columnist and author Jonah Goldberg. He's a senior editor at National Review and holds the Cliff Asnes Chair in Applied Liberty at the American Enterprise Institute. His latest book is The Suicide of the West, How the Rebirth of Tribalism, Populism, Nationalism, and Identity Politics is Destroying American Democracy. Jonah, welcome to Econ Talk. I am delighted to be here. I am a and, and listeners should know uh, Russ does not has has only looked at the galley of this book and does not know that I actually credit Econ Talk in the acknowledgments because I am such a crazy fanboy of this podcast. So I'm delighted to be here. Well, that's very kind of you. Much appreciated. Yeah. Uh, it's a fascinating book. Um, uh, it's a disturbing book. It's a somewhat depressing book at times, I and mean, maybe we'll look for some bright spots on the horizon uh, <laughs> in our conversation. But I want to start with your uh, a paragraph from your very uh, near the beginning of the book. You say the following: My argument begins with some assertions. Capitalism is unnatural. Democracy is unnatural. Human rights are unnatural. The world we live in today is unnatural, and we stumbled into it more or less by accident. The natural state of mankind is grinding poverty punctuated by horrific violence, terminating with an early death. It was like this for a very, very long time. Uh, Elaborate on that. And talk sure. about what you mean by the miracle, which is the unnaturalness that we're in the middle of. Right. So, what I mean, let me. I'll just start with what I mean by unnatural. Um, if you took a jar of ants and you dumped them on a planet very much like ours with our atmosphere, um, ants would do what ants do, and they would build little colonies and they would, you know, dig their little ant tunnels. If you took a pack of dogs and you put them in the wild, they would very quickly become a natural pack like they they would. If you took human beings absent all of the stuff that they learn from culture and education today and put them in the wild, they would not all of a sudden start building houses and schools and and have startups. They would take to the trees and have spears and it would take a long time to discover spears and they would behave um, the way that we are wired to behave. One of the one of the core beliefs I have about a definition of, of at the heart of conservatism is that is this idea that human nature has no history. And, um, and so when I say that capitalism is unnatural, if it were natural, if it were the way human beings like ants or dogs or any other creature naturally behaves in its natural environment, we would have developed capitalism a little earlier in the um, evolutionary history of man. We would have developed democracy in a little earlier in the evolutionary history of man, you know, in the 250,000 years since, give or take, since we split off from the Neanderthals, um, uh, the amount of time where we had any conception of natural rights, particularly for strangers, right? People within the tribe, that's different. But for strangers, the idea that someone we just met has any dignity or or any claim on justice, um, that is a re- astoundingly new idea in human history. And um, this whole world that we live in, you know, so big – a big inspiration for this book is this idea that you talk a lot about on Econ Talk, which is Hayek's distinction between the microcosm or the microcosmos and the macrocosm. Yeah. And I, I take Hayek, you know, I think Hayek is absolutely correct where he says that we were, we evolved to live in small bands of people, troops, tribes, whatever, whatever label you want to call them, um, and that's how our brains are structured. And our brains haven't changed very much in the last 10, 11,000 years since the agricultural revolution. And so this entire extended order of liberty and contracts and uh, the monopoly of monopoly on violence of the state, all of these things are really new. They don't come to us naturally. We have to be taught them. We have to be civilized as a verb into believing in these things. And um, this this 
economic, you know, mirror. And so the miracle is, and I'm, I'm, I was heavily influenced by Deirdre McCloskey, and I, I, I think she gets a lot right, but we can talk about one of the things I think she might get wrong later. But, you know, for, uh, you know, what is it, 7,500 generations, for 200, 300,000 years, the average human being everywhere in the world lived on average on about $3 a day. Um, I think it's Todd Buchholz who says, you know, uh, a uh, that man lived no better on, uh, for most of man's existence, he lived no better on two legs than he had on four. And it is only when you get this radical change in ideas that comes from the bottom up, um, what I call the Lockean revolution, but I don't think Locke gets credit for it. Um, he just simply sort of represents it. Um, for the first time in all of human history, basically in one place, this little corner of Europe, human prosperity, human wealth starts to explode. And that explosion radiates out around the world and is still doing so today. And that is a miracle. And the reason I call it a miracle is not because I think God delivered it. The first sentence of the book is there is no God in this book. Um, and I promise you don't quite keep it. It's probably, I, I know I what you meant. We could talk about it. <laughs> yeah, that's but all right. What I'm saying is that it's not providential, right? God yeah. didn't suddenly decide to give us all of this bounty. Um, it's a miracle because you people, you you know, you you witches and warlock, warlocks of the economic profession, have not reached a consensus about why the hell it happened. You know, there's a consensus about the 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 three dollars a day stuff, but there's not a consensus about why this miracle of this explosion of of rights, liberties, and prosperity happened. And no one planned it. We stumbled into it by accident. And um, and my argument is that we should be incredibly grateful for it and therefore protective of it. You only protect those things you're grateful for. And that's what I that's sort of the opening praise of the book, I guess. Yeah, just a couple of comments. So uh, yeah, I always Think of it as the goose that lays the golden eggs. And if you have a goose that just ha- – all of a sudden you get this goose that happens to be laying golden eggs instead of regular ones, you, you'd kind of want to be interested in what keeps the goose healthy and alive and <clears throat> how this came to happen uh, as you can keep it going. And we we seem to be somewhat oblivious of it. I think it's a human trait to be um, – take things for granted and to think that tomorrow will be like yesterday. Uh, and so the, the arrow of progress – we presume just is a natural thing, and as you point out, it's it's hard to accept, but it, it's not so natural. Right. And, and just to expand on the Hayek point, you know, in the Fatal Conceit, he says this microcosmos and macrocosmos. We have two. We have to have two ways of thinking about the world. In our small families, or our bands, or our tribes, or our communities, we have a, a more socialist, what we would, you and I would call a socialist enterprise. Uh, we 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 don't sell stuff to our kids. Typically, we share. Uh, it's top down, not bottom up uh, in the family. The, the parents tend to run things. And um, that's very appropriate in a small group that's held together by bonds of love or genetics or whatever keeps it together. And he says, we have to have a different mindset when we go out into the extended order, when we're traders and commercial actors. And he said, we have a tendency to try to take the beautiful and poetic ethos of the family and extend it into the larger order. And he says, that leads to tyranny. Right. And I, in a way, that's that's one of what I – you might – it's one of the things you're worried about in your book, which is that the tribalism that we are hardwired for uh, seems to be spreading beyond the uh, immediate family. That's right. I mean, it's um... – and I think it's worth pointing out it it it's 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 disastrous going both ways. It is yeah, disastrous. Makes that point, yeah, right, right. It's disastrous to treat the larger society like a family or tribe, but it's also disaster. You know, getting your gemeinschaft shaft and your gazelle shaft is always a problem, and in treating your um, family like a contractual society destroys the family. And um, both are both are really really. Bad, and I agree with you. It's not just that we're socialist. I mean, the way I always put it is, we're literally communist in the sense that it, in, in my family, it is from each according to his yep, ability, yeah, exactly. each according to his need. You have a sick kid, you don't do any kind of calculus about what what their contribution to the family is. Yep. You just do whatever they need, you know. Yep. Um, and yeah, so part of my argument is that um, you know the the 
Roman philosopher, Greek, Roman philosopher Horace has this line where he says, you can chase nature without, you can chase her, chase nature out with a pitchfork, but it always comes running back in. And so part of my argument is that um, human nature is always with us, right? We are born with it. That is the, that's the preloaded software of the human condition. And you, you can't erase that hard drive. Um, all you can do is channel and harness human nature towards productive ends as best you can. And when you don't do that, human nature will assert itself. And I, I, I think of this in terms of corruption, that just as if you don't maintain or upkeep a car or a boat or a house, um, the second law of thermodynamics or entropy or just rust will, have, you know, rust never sleeps. Eventually nature reclaims everything. And that's true of civilizations too. And if we don't civilize people to understand this distinction between the micro and the macrocosm, um, what inevitably happens is, is that the logic of the microcosm, the desire to live tribally, which we're all born with, um, starts to infect politics. And if you're not on guard for it, it can swamp politics. And, I, and this is why I, I would argue that virtually every form of authoritarianism, totalitarianism, um, whether you want to call it right wing or left wing, doesn't really matter to me anymore. Um, they're all reactionary because they are all trying to restore that tribal sense of social solidarity whether you know it's a monarchy or uh, or treating the, the leader of the country as the father of the country or the the or the fuhrer or whatever you want to call it, or whether you're just saying that the entire society is just one family, whether it's nationalism or socialism or or populism, all of these things are basically the reassertion of human nature, which says I don't like your artificial constraints on my human desires and my desire for my group to be victorious, and that is the fundamental form of political corruption. I think that's profound, and I I used to be much more of an optimist. Um, I think on my Wikipedia page, which <clears throat> which I've never tampered with, but I think it talks about the the early days of econ talk. I used to always ask people if they were optimistic, and I always tried to end on an optimistic note. I'm much less optimistic in 2018 than I was in 2006 uh, when econ talk started. And one of the things I've been obviously aware of, I think any thoughtful person has to be aware of, that things have changed a lot in the last five years not just in America, but around the world. Uh, populism is definitely on the rise. Tribalism is definitely on the rise, uh, or at least it appears to be. There is a question of whether social media has just made us more aware of it. Uh, I, I wonder about that, and we, we've talked about that on the program as well. But the world seems to be uh, – I think a thoughtful person has to be aware that the veneer of civilization is thinner than you might think. And I think that's what – another way to say – what you're, the Horace quote about human nature rushing back in or uh, whatever, right. whatever's dark in the human heart rushing rushing back in. But, but I want to challenge the claim about nature – whether whether civilization is something like a car out in a field, which it's a okay. beautiful metaphor. Um, and, it, and it's haunting and it grabs your attention and it, and it effectively – it's very effective. It, it did alarm me and had a sister <laughs> creepy um, – feel to it. it. It's like a scene from a horror movie. Um, and it's definitely true that stuff left out in the woods tends to rot. But is that really true about, about civilization? That is, I and mean, one of the great things about economics, or excuse me, about capitalism, about economic freedom, is that you don't have to understand it. Uh, and and I've, I think I've used the, the same metaphor of the ant colony, you know, the ant trundling down the path back to the ant hill bringing some pheromone with it from some food source is unknowingly helping to guide the colony. And the cumulative effect of all the different ants is going to have that impact. The ants get in a war. Um, the, the queen, um, the queen bee in a, in a beehive, and I think it's a queen ant, whatever it is. But the, the queen makes it sound like, like she's in charge. She's not. She, she's just the sort of repository of the wisdom of crowds that the ants or the right. bees bring in. And that steers unintendedly by the warriors and the workers. It changes the ratio of new kind of ants that get created, and it's an extraordinary thing. And we have the same thing. Uh, you know, you go, you're trying to do the best you can for your business or your kids in, in your commercial dealings, and you help create this wonderful division of labor that Smith understood 
creates prosperity. So why do I have to understand? Why do I have to keep? Why do I have to worry about? It? I'm doing fine. I'm doing my little thing. Uh, it's pleasant that as listeners to Econ Talk, you'll learn more about how the colony, wor- the, the ecosystem of of economics works. That there's, there are these incredible uh, connections that that spur cooperation with anyone's knowledge, no one's plan. The so-called invisible hand. That's lovely. Why is it at risk if I don't understand it? Why do I have to know? Think about it. How is that going to get reclaimed by by nature and 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 start to rot? Okay, um, it's fair. It's a fair. It's a fair question. And um, I can keep asking. You want me to keep going? No, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, slightly longer than I intended. No, no, no. It's fine. Uh, um, so uh, I guess here's a good point for me to sort of make my argument against Deirdre McCloskey, who again was a huge influence on me in all this, and. You know, she argues and you that, cite her many, many, many times yes, in the book. Yes. Um, she she argues that the you know, what I call the you know, call it the miracle, call it the locking revolution, call it, you know, whatever you want to call it. This explosion of prosperity and natural right and, and, and rights and the sovereignty of the individual and innovation all comes about because of words. Um, and what she means by words is is our. Uh, is ideas is that you know for most of human history innovation was considered a sin uh, literally in the Catholic Church it was the sin of curitas which means questioning the natural order where you had guilds and priests and uh, ar- aristocrats who were constraining the market for their own benefit channeling resources to themselves limiting competition and um, by accident, again, by accident, and partly because of the Protestant Reformation, but partly for other things, you have the emergence of a middle class, this sort of bourgeois ideology comes about, where people start asserting their rights, and all of a sudden, innovation is seen as a good thing, particularly just in England and, and Holland, but then it starts to spread. And so it's, it's ideas, it's words, it's not something structural, it's not the accumulation of capital, it's not slavery, it's not, it's not empire, it's ideas that change. And I, I think that's largely right. I, I do think she's too hostile to the sort of Douglas North uh, institutional stuff, which I think is really important, too. But words create the world that we live in. That's how we understand ideas. Um, uh, I should say language because there's more to language than just yeah, words. And I would just and I would add, I think she, I think she'd add rhetoric that the way right. we frame the way we that's see ourselves, the language we use to describe the narrative of our lives and our, our culture and our society. That's right. I mean, one of the ways I put it is, is that a civilization is simply the story a, a society tells itself about itself. Yeah. And um, um, the, the, the Achilles heel of that argument is that what can be created by words can be destroyed by words. And I think, I think McCloskey is too optimistic about the ability of this thing we call Western civilization or liberal democratic capitalism to be on autopilot. And here I'm, I'm much more convinced by Joseph, Joseph Schumpeter, and I have quite a bit about Schumpeter in the book, although not nearly as much as I originally wrote. I had to cut a lot out, um, where Sch, uh, you know, Schumpeter predicts the demise of capitalism by saying that the ranks of the very rich, the industrialists, the business class, they have kids who don't want to be entrepreneurs. They want to be um, idea merchants, essentially, whether it's artists, poets, Hollywood producers, writers, journalists, lawyers – these are these are idea merchants, and I I believe that one of the problems we have in our society, and it particularly is true in the humanities on college campuses, is that we are we we have generated a vast class of people who are professionally invested in the idea of undermining commitments to the market, even to democracy, certainly to free speech. Um, they are becoming increasingly hostile to the story we tell ourselves about ourselves. If you look at the Howard Zinn version of American history, the only legitimate history to tell is the history of all the bad things that we have done and that capitalism has done. And I'm in favor of telling all of those things if they're true, but we should also talk about the positive things. And we don't. And as a culture, we have generated this vast industry of people belittling um the society that we live in, of saying that we shouldn't be grateful for the society, that we should feel entitled entitlement being the opposite of gratitude, um, and that we should be resentful. And, and the, argue, the, the, so the reason why people like you, who, you know, all praise and honor upon you are on the right side of these arguments is that the world is a better place because you do this podcast and you try to make these arguments. 
the whole point of a civilization is that you got to fight for it. And I don't mean necessarily with guns and knives and bombs, although I, I, in, I, sometimes in history that's necessary, but with words, by actually defending the good things about the market, defending using rhetoric for positive aims. Right now, something like one in two millennials would rather live in a socialist or communist country, or at least they say so. Um, and that's, that should be dismaying because they're wrong. And um, but so much of our problems today isn't that all of America is bad or all of the West is bad. It's that most of the people who really think it's good are too busy with their own lives to do much by way of of standing up and defending what we've got. And that's a problem. Well, and of, that's that's the suicide and the suicide of West is that, it, that this is a choice that society makes to defend itself or to let it sort of seep back into its own nature. Yeah, I. I sort of agree with that. I don't. I don't think society makes choices. But I think all of us individuals, if, if we're not careful and we keep our head down too much, the people who keep their heads up are going to take charge right. and and do some do some damage. I, I just want to put a little footnote to your point about emphasizing the the bad versus the a more general picture. One of the things I really like in the book uh, is your point that the. Our society, our history, America's history gets often gets criticized for hypocrisy. Um, all, yeah, all men are created equal. What about women? What about slaves? What about et cetera, et cetera? And, and you make the point often in the book that by laying down that marker of equality, we gave people like Martin Luther King and others the cudgel to beat America into a better world and I right. into a better country, into a better society. I think that's an extremely important point that in the culture war is about – uh, colonialism and and uh, various isms of sexism, racism, et cetera. I, I think that's often forgotten or not noticed. And I, I thought that was brilliant. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's it's this, you know, it, it, people want to point out how we had slavery. Well, of course we had slavery. Almost every society, almost every inhabited continent since the agricultural revolution had slavery. What was new about the West and what was new about the um, you know, we, and America doesn't get that much credit for ending slavery because, you know, we should have done it. We never should have had it in the first place. But and this coronavirus some people died to stop to it, get which, rid is, of it. which is awful. <laughs> right. You know, but it's also saying something. You know, I mean, this idea that we didn't you know, that we've never come to grips with slavery. Well, you know, we did have this ugly war where fellow citizens killed each other. And then we amended the Constitution a few times to get rid of it. Um, but the point was, is that, you know, starting with Abraham Lincoln reinventing the Declaration of Independence and then Martin Luther King taking it. And then, you know, to be, I've been very rough on Barack Obama, but, you know, Barack Obama made that argument repeatedly that, you know, the best this is the point about the 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 you the store, the best story we tell ourselves about ourselves. What is the, what are the best ideals about ourselves? And those can be found in the founding and those can be found in the arguments uh, of John Locke, which you just have to extend out to their logical conclusion. That was the gift that comes from back then is the the seed stock for this rhetoric that transformed the world. So I think the – I mean I, I'm a big fan of Deirdre's. I think rhetoric matters. I'm not sure she's right. Who knows? It's tough. Obviously can't be proven and it's a provocative thesis that rhetoric matters as much as she says it does. But I do think the stories that we tell ourselves have changed – over the last 200 years, obviously, and whether that's a response to the chain, underlying change or whether it's the causal agent, uh, it's kind of irrelevant. Obviously, I think causation runs in, in both directions. And I earlier, a few minutes ago, challenged you on this capitalism thing about doesn't it have some self-sustaining characteristics? And I think it does. I, I do think – but I do think that in, in democracy, your, your point is easier to make. So I want to try to make it in a different way than uh, than you make it in the book and see if you agree with me. Okay. Um, in my view, the Constitution is irrelevant as a restraint on government power except in two areas, two amendments, first and second. Still, some, We still have some devotion to freedom of speech. It's, affects, it's affected our campaign finance. It does still affect – government's power to limit certain uh, speech that, quote, it doesn't like or that powerful people don't like. Uh, and we still have uh, the right to bear arms. Uh, both of those are under attack mm -hmm. uh, from, from the left and the right. And as I think you point out, or maybe I saw it somewhere else, uh, you know, majority rule, 
not in favor probably be, maybe of either of those amendments right now. You, right. It's not clear you'd get a, you'd get a majority in a, in a referendum to support those. And the whole idea of the Constitution is, in my view, now seeing it through the lens of your book in a very helpful way, is to it's to restrain. On the narrow sense, it restrains the power of government. On the deeper sense, it restrains the the, the rule of humans over the rule. Instead of the rule of law, it restrains the kind of corruption and return to tribalism and authoritarianism that, that you're, of course, and I were both very worried about. And I, what I see the last hundred years is the slow erosion. It's very slow. It's like the rust. You don't see it. The, the, every day you go out to the car that's sitting in the field and it looks like it looked like yesterday. Right. But after 10 years, it doesn't look as good. And after 100 years, it's radically different. And we've radically changed both – the effectiveness of the Constitution and the way we talk about it. And I think we've gone to a world of what I what I think of as the case-by-case basis. We, we don't want to use principles. Let's just look at this case because principles in any one case might be wrong. So let's not let them ruin it. Let's, let's look at this case. Does, should it apply here? And often the answer is no. So, okay, let's go to the next case. And, of course, that debate isn't a reasoned – civilized discussion of thoughtful truth seekers. It's an angry, political, manipulative, self-deceiving, no necessary incentive to be fully informed screaming match. And so we're losing, I think on the democracy argument, we're heading down a very dangerous path. No, I, I, I think that's right. And um, the for me, the, the one of the things that I sort of learned in a more visceral way while working on this was, you know, it's interesting when you read the constitution, there's almost, and, or, or the federal's papers, there's remarkably little opining about what would be good or bad policies or politics. Yeah. It's, it's almost all procedural. And the, the, because for the founders, what they, what they were worried about wasn't that the government might do X or Y. It's that just power Qua power yeah. would concentrate itself too much, right? And there's that. I mean, I I, I feel like I'm bringing Coles to Newcastle, bringing sure. up Adam Smith with you, but um, do uh, so, do so. You know, there's that. Although famous, somebody did tweet when you said Adam Smith, uh, I should say Adam who, but yeah, I, I know I know the one you're talking about. It's a good <laughs> um, line. So <laughs> w- w- when Adam Smith says, uh, you know, never do two. I mean, you probably do it by heart. I can just paraphrase. You'll never get two businessmen sitting or people of the same trade sitting together where the conversation won't eventually turn to a conspiracy against the public good. And, you know, the left likes to, to mangle that about making it somehow about the nature of businessmen or industrialists or the ruling classes. Yeah, they're greedy. The is, they're greedy, unlike the rest of us. <laughs> that's right. And, and that's the problem is that the reality is, is that we're all greedy. We're all greedy. <laughs> self-interest is built into us. And whenever people have a group self-interest, a common interest, they will conspire against the public good. And that's true of teachers unions. That's true of football teams. That's true of everybody because it is, it is the, it is what the, the evolutionary psychologist, uh, John Tooby calls the coalition instinct. You know, we, we form around an interest and then we defend it, you know, against all attacks, reasonable or otherwise. And, uh, the founders understood this passionately and they called this coalition instinct faction. And so we're recording this amidst all of a lot of hullabaloo about, protectionism and trade. And it seems to me that the best way of understanding this is that the steel industry is a faction and there's nothing wrong with factions figuring out how to maneuver for the best interest of their, their members, whether it's teachers unions or anybody else, it only becomes bad when you enlist the power of government to your side and pick one winner against other factions. And that's what the founders wanted to protect against. And that, that, that concern has just flown by the wayside in the political moment that we're in, where basically every faction claims that they have the right to use government force any way that they want. And, you know, before you were talking about principle, it reminds me, I think it's in the book, it's one of my favorite lines from Huey Long, who was one of the original great populist politicians. He says, we got to stop talking about what's, you know, what's right. We got to stop talking, you know, we got to stop talking about principles and just do what's right. Yeah. You know? And that's the attitude that, pervades vast swaths of both the left and the right these days. Well, what fascinates me, and it, you don't talk about this directly, but it's, again, you know, clearly p- part of, of, 
of what you're talking about is that um, uh, you and I, are, neither of us were fans or big fans of either the current president or the past most recent president. Right. Uh, and one of the things that alarmed me, and I'm sure it alarmed you about the last five presidents is the growth in executive power, right. the ability of presidents to act unilaterally and to uh, do stuff that is, quote, undemocratic. Um, and and when I would point this out, I think a lot of people's reaction is, well, but he's good. So it's right. OK that he's powerful. And then you get a president that is also more powerful than the one before which is – that seems to be the trend. And the people who who were cheering when their side had all the power and did all these extra legal things, now they're horrified. You'd think the reaction would be, I think the president should be less powerful. Instead, the reaction seems to be, oh, we got to get our guy back in. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't, I don't understand why people don't see that – now, I'm just going to – just, I'm going to digress here for a minute. Uh, you know, one of my favorite Econ Talk episodes is with Bruce Blaine and a Mosquito from, I think, 2006 or seven, And he, we're talking about power. And uh, he mentioned King Leopold of Belgium. And King Leopold of Belgium, he pointed out, was, belo- is, was beloved in Belgium for a lot of reforms he made and, and social p- policies. He's not so popular in the Belgian Congo where he was the instrument of murdering, right. murdering, I think – Certainly hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. Yeah. Yeah. And in, in the Belgian Congo, he had a free hand. It was his colony, Belgium's, Belgium's colony. At home, he was constrained by the parliament. And Bruce's question was, which one's the real King Leopold? The one who was the sort of moderate social reformer or the murderer? He said, well, you'd want to look at where he had the free hand. And your point really is, well, we're all like King Leopold when we have a free hand. We're all dangerous. We're all – Come with that same hardwired view and, and, and this idea that somehow, oh, but we're so civilized now. We don't have to worry about America becoming a tyranny. Are you crazy? We're so much more educated. And that's just a total misunderstanding to me of education, human nature. And even today, the left, which is horrified at, at President Trump, I don't think – I think they just want to get a better guy in and I just want to get less power in the presidency. I, look, I, I think that's exactly right. Two, two quick points on this. One is um, the, I have problems with the way people use Lord Acton's quote about power corrupts absolutely. But in this sense, why? The, What's your well, problem with that? Well, I, I think it's true. And I was just about to explain why I think it's true. But my, <laughs> but, but the, historically, my understanding, and I wrote about this in my last book, is that – and it's relevant to this discussion in a lot of ways – is that um, Acton was – coin that that line comes from a series of letters correspondence that he had with a guy i believe his name was creighton who was a historian of the papacy and he was writing a his, history of popes and the historian was asking should i make allowances for the bad popes because they were powerful and they did good things but they also did bad things and all that kind of stuff and acton's point in that context was not that the absolute power corrupted the powerful it corrupts the people around him Mm-hmm. In that you make allow, look you you ju- and again we don't want to get deep into the politics stuff, but you look at what has happened to a lot of my friends on the right, who have said with blinding passion, X whatever X is, whether it's free trade or pro immigration or whatever, and then you get Donald Trump into power, and and Donald Trump comes in screaming Y, and instead of X, you mean instead of X, yeah. and all of these people who have invested their careers and their integrity. In arguing for X, their entire adult lives are all of a sudden saying, well, you know, maybe it is Y. Or, you know, Donald Trump is brilliant and he knows things better than I do. So it is Y, right? That is the, so like in the story of the emperor has no clothes. The corruption is all of the people who are willing to say that he had great clothes on. Yeah, and well, the fascinating thing for me is that this – I understand why people say that who want power, right? We understand why, why absolute power corrupts absolutely. And I, I appreciate your extended thoughts on Acton, and I want to just add that at least he said it. That's a huge yeah. – <laughs> no, I mean you know, usually we misattribute insights from various people, well, but I true. think he did get – we, we, <laughs> that he said it, I think, is it, that we recognize that. So it's certainly a plus for accuracy. But I do th- – you know, people have always changed their views 
and adjusted their views and, and retold the story to themselves because they want to be on the, on the, on the right side of uh, power, not the right side of history, the right side right. of power. Why is it – and this is a, a puzzle that I think a reader of your book has to ask, and I'm not sure you answer it. And so either tell me if you did and if you didn't what your thoughts on it are. Why now? What is about this moment that's caused tribalism – uh, and, and we haven't talked enough about what that is. But the, the, the partisanship, it's not just partisanship. It's, and we've talked about this in other, we recently talked about it with Pluck, Rose, and Lindsay in that episode. Uh, it's not just, oh, you know, I don't agree with you. It's that my team is always right and your team isn't just wrong it, and always wrong. It's evil. It's a threat right. to our future. And both sides, left and right, are making that argument today. And that seems to me to be the road to, um, to violence. We're, gonna, yeah. we're, we're really at risk. And why so, now? What's different? All right. So I, I, I think I do try to answer this question. And I, I think, uh, first of all, I think you're right. You know, my, I have a, actually a New Yorker cartoon. It's my favorite New Yorker cartoon that my wife had blown up and framed for me for a birthday present. And it has two dogs sitting at a bar in pinstripes and suits and one dog and drinking martinis. And one dog says to the other dog, you know, it's not good enough that dogs succeed. Cats must also fail. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the world that we're living in now, right? Where I, I think I use the phrase in the book, ecstatic schadenfreude, yeah. where all you want that, that a, a, a position or a statement or a policy, so long as it makes the other side cry. You know, I mean, all this nonsense on Twitter with your tears are delicious and butter, it's also juvenile, but that is what defines vast swaths of, of our politics today. And it's pathetic. And I, I, so I think part of why we're there, and I think this gets back to what I wanted to say about the thing about, you know, getting our guy in power versus your guy in power. Um, part of it is, you know, it's like it, in, in, in England in the 1600s, if you had a Catholic on the throne and you were a Protestant, that, that was felt as a threat to your very existence and, the, and your, under, your self-understanding and your understanding of your society – and vice versa. And for a long time now, the presidency has become more and more of a symbol in the culture wars. And when when our guy is on the throne, as it were, that's a symbol that our side is winning and we're heading to kind of we're heading towards the kind of America that we think we should be in. And and when our when the other guy is in power or on the throne, it is this sense that everything is coming unraveled. And I think one of the reasons why we're in this moment now is because Civil society is in such terrible shape. Yeah. And this, get, get, this gets us back to where we were at the beginning with the microcosm and the macrocosm. The only place where you can reliably have a sense of real meaning, of uh, a feeling of, of, of earned success, a feeling of, um, of true belonging is in the microcosm. You can get a sort of a cheap fake version of it in the macrocosm during a time of war when the logic of the microcosm actually does apply to the macrocosm, right? I mean, that's what a moral equivalent of war argument is, where we all have to drop what we're doing and, and become nationalists, right? And there are these moments of fever pitch nationalism or socialism or populism that serve as a substitute. But in terms of an actually satisfying life, you can only get that sense of feeling needed, because that's what really a satisfying life is is when you realize that others that you care for need you and value you. And you can only get that in the microcosm. And that's what civil society is. It's a thousand different little microcosms. And as those start to break down, particularly the family, but also local communities, the receding of religion and life, I think that one of the things you have is you don't have, you know, Robert Nisbet, the soci one of my favorite sociologists, he called it the quest for community. We're hardwired with this. We want to live in tribes. We want to live in little platoons. And if civil society does not afford those to us, we do not lose that hunger. We look elsewhere. And in more and more in our politics, more and more in our life, the only place that is promising that kind of meaning is politics. And the Democrats have been doing it far longer. It was FDR who coined the forgotten man. Um, and, you know, when LBJ was pressed to define what the great society was, he said ultimately it was about love. Um and, you know, the, the life of Julia and all that stuff that Barack Obama told about how the government is the one thing that we all do together. And the first sentence that was uttered at the Democratic Convention in 2012 was government is the one thing we all belong to. 
which creeps me out and probably creeps you out, but that's but we're not the intended audience. A lot of people think it's a beautiful thing, and anytime I complain about it on this program, I get angry emails and, and comments, but I, I agree with you. I think it's not a good thing. I, and I so the national parties are selling meaning, and the Republican Party is a late arrival to this, and they have, they have capitulated in, or I should say, sort of conservatism, Inc., has capitulated to a lot of this stuff. Um, you look at the ads from the NRA and so much of it has nothing to do with guns. I agree with the NRA on most of its gun policy stuff, but this sort of seething resentment and cultural divide politics that they're peddling creeps me out. And so I think one of the things that is happening is that as civil, as civil society and local community offer less opportunities or fewer opportunities to provide meaning, more and more people, as Robert Putnam would put it, retreat or hunker down. They retreat to social media, which exacerbates all of these problems, and they follow politics like it's entertainment. Oh, for sure. And um, the best example of this, there's a blogger, Ace of Spades, who I, 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 I no longer <laughs> get, get along with too well, but he coined this phrase, which I think was kind of brilliant, called the MacGuffinization of politics, which in, you know, in, in film, the MacGuffin is just, some, is just the thing the hero wants. Right. So the Maltese Falcon is the classic MacGuffin or the briefcase in Pulp Fiction is a classic MacGuffin. And the media, both right wing and left wing and mainstream, they cover politics like public policy is the MacGuffin. And so you have Barack Obama saying, I think it was 28 times that he could not unilaterally do DACA because the Constitution prevents him from doing that. And Talk about the, the delayed the, the dream. I mean, the dreamers. The dreamers. Kind of, it's a little different than the dreamers, but yeah, it's about helping these kids Status. who came here under no choice, no fault of their own. And and I think we should do something. There's not a, my point is not about immigration policy, but he said over and over again he could not do this because the con- he's not a king. The Constitution prevents him. And then he just decided to do it. He reversed himself. And almost no one in the media covered it in, in terms of, oh, my gosh, the president is violating the Constitution, which he – the constitutional principle, which he had established just a week ago – they all said, aha, the hero of the story has overcome a problem. And look what the bad guys are saying. And that's how that's how Fox News covers Donald Trump, is he's the hero, and whatever he wants is the MacGuffin, even if he contradicts himself. And, and the sort of left-wing or mainstream media, the way they co- cover Donald Trump is he's the villain. But the point is, is that everyone is talking and thinking in terms of entertainment and drama and reality show. And in that universe, that sort of romantic universe, arguments about the Constitution don't ruin the plot. Come on, yeah, exactly. we, I need a Deus Ex Machina here. Don't, don't, don't. don't. Well, that's the problem. It's, it's like whenever you see a movie about something you actually know something about, and you turn to the person next to you, and say, you know, it doesn't work that way. They say, "Shut up." Yeah, don't ruin the movie for me. Yeah, yeah my 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 favorite example of this, and as an economist, is the Bush administration and the policymakers surrounding it um, at Treasury and. And at the Fed, when uh, when Bear Stearns <laughs> wasn't going to be able to keep its promises, the government made sure that they were purchased uh, over a weekend. And because it, would, it was unrealistic, or for political reasons, uh, the purchaser wasn't uh, able to do the due diligence to figure out exactly what they were buying. So the government said, don't worry, we'll, <laughs> we'll, <laughs> we'll take care of it. That was extraordinarily uh, uncapitalist to take <laughs> to take an example. Uh, yeah. One just one example of when it was uncapitalist uh, and was instead crony capitalist during the financial crisis. And yet, when when Lehman Brothers was about to go bankrupt, they said, you know, they actually claim they actually think we're stupid and <laughs> suckers and and as you point out, moviegoers. They were going to love this story arc because the story arc there was, oh, we couldn't do it again. Really? <laughs> and they said – and I think I think Bernanke or somebody says, yeah, we just – it wasn't – we could – the rules you – know, or, or why was it that creditors of institutions that had taken risks with money that were horrific should get back 99 – should get back 100 cents on the dollar? Yeah. Oh, we couldn't intervene and – couldn't intervene in markets. I mean they'd made promise or or they couldn't – Say punish the executives. Oh, that would be I wouldn't be capitalist. Well, why is it that some things are capitalist, and some things are? Why are some things constrained by the rule of law, and other things aren't? And then you start to think, well, maybe it doesn't have anything to do with the rule of law. Maybe it's just I'm helping my friends, and when it's convenient to help my friends, and I like to point out, 
no one's ever written about this. People out there who have the potential to write about it, I wish they would look into it, but uh, I've never seen anyone write about it. Lehman Brothers creditors, its largest creditors were not American banks. They were foreign banks. Now, oh, is that, that relevant for why they were – their creditors had to, had to eat a lot of their losses? I, seems, I don't know. Possible, yeah. but 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 they're hand wringing. Oh yeah, we couldn't do. We had to. Mm. It's like <laughs> really. And 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 by the way, I just want to. This is a total digression, but it's in the. It's at least it's in the book. One of the coolest things in the book is a paragraph where you point out about human nature that when we talk about going to movies or these kind of narratives that we we sit and are and are entertained by, we use this phrase: the willing suspension of disbelief. That when we sit in a movie, we pretend that it's real. We, that we that we're going to cry when this character dies, even though it's a fictional character. Right. But you point out it's not the willingness; it's the unwillingness. We have no. It's so natural to us to suspend disbelief and just immerse ourselves in an era. And I think for political purposes and understanding what's going on, I think that's a very powerful insight. It's not a digression. Yeah. No, no, no I, I like the digression, and um, uh, and it's you know, but it, it's. True that we just want. I mean, like, and and again, I, I, you know, we don't want to get into. We have people who are listening on all sides of the pol- political aisle, but you know, I think it is as a matter of analysis, objectively true that Donald Trump has broken the blood-brain barrier between entertainment and politics. Oh, for sure. And I and I said in 2015 that I don't think Democrats appreciate the precedent that this is setting because, um, you know, Republicans. Our list of, and I, I use our advisedly, but Republicans, our list yeah, speak of, for yourself, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 of celebrities, you know, after Ted Nugent and Scott Baio, it kind of runs dry. And meanwhile, look at all this talk about Oprah running, right? Look yeah. at all this talk about Tom Hanks. Um, the power of celebrity in this culture, it used to be that this was one of these great divides culturally where like Wall Street people thought, you know, and, 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 and actually throughout almost all of human history, from Kabuki to ancient Greek theater, actors were considered a very low class, you know, part of society. Yeah. And now I think because of human nature, we are turning them into essentially, you know, celebrity is becoming a de facto kind of aristocracy. You know, we talk about Hollywood dynasties and um, and we also talk about political dynasties. That's all human nature reasserting itself in weird, funky ways. And um, well, to be fair, but to be fair to the to to Donald Trump, he's really just the natural progression. You you start it whenever you want. You want to start at Reagan, right? He's he's a pretty good example of an actor who was able to turn those acting chops into a successful political career. Uh, FDR understood that even though he was handicapped, you never saw him in a wheelchair. The theater of, of politics is is very old. No, no, I agree with that. There's always been some theater in politics, but you know, I mean, to defend Ronald Reagan for a second, I mean, the guy actually did his homework, um, and uh, you know, he had been a governor, and he, you know, he read Hayek, he he learned a lot when he was a spokesman for GE, and he at least understood that he had to pay his dues about understanding what he was talking about. Um, and so I agree with you; it's a process, you know, in mass entertainment, starting with FDR and radio. Um, has affected, and then obviously TV and JFK and all that has affected politics in a lot of ways. And so I agree, Donald Trump didn't start this. He is, but he's also not going to finish it. Yep. This trend is going to continue, and um, it is. It, it doesn't seem to me. I mean, like a lot of people made fun of the movie Idiocracy, <laughs> but you know, in a lot of ways, that seems to be where we're heading. Where you know, life is a TV show now, and the problem is, is that um, as you point out, you know. Uh, our brains are not wired to say, oh, this is fake when we immerse ourselves in things we watch on TV. And um, we can all get MacGuffinized. We can all get swept up into the sort of entertainment value of all of this stuff, which naturally encourages tribal thinking, which naturally appeals to not our reason but to our emotions. And that's what populism has always been, is this appeal to emotion over reason. And um, that's why it has always been dangerous, um, whether it comes of a left wing variety or a right wing variety. The only populist movement I ever had any sympathy for were for the Tea Parties, 
because at least they were arguing, they were making, they had the right rhetoric as far as I was concerned about back to basics, living within our means, living by the constitution. But for the most part, you know, uh, William Jennings Bryan had the best summation of populism where he said, um, the people of Nebraska are for free silver. Therefore I'm for free silver. I will look up the arguments later. Yeah, that, that, um, I, I'd say that, that, insight goes for all of us. Um, we have this very natural tribal instinct to figure out what the tribe wants and then, or what's good for the tribe. And then we'll justify it later. We, we don't like to think of ourselves that way. Uh, we like to think of ourselves as truth seekers who find the right arguments and then join the right tribe after that. And I think that's a misunderstanding of human nature. Um, it's why I think the pragmatist philosophical movement, the pragmatists are correct that um, reason is, it, it goes back to Hume, of course, that reason is a is overrated. <laughs> that we, we tend to oversell our own ability to reason and think up uh, later what, what comes next. And Haidt, Jonathan Haidt, of course, plums this very well in, in, this, in The Righteous Mind. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I got a lot out of a righteous mind. Um, I, one day, perhaps in the future, I can come back on and argue with you about pragmatism because I have a lot of problems with Dewey and James and what what, what the progressives did with pragmatism. But in general, I agree with you in, in the sense that you mean it, that it's about to be, it, it, democracy is supposed to be about arguments. It's supposed to be about disagreements. It's supposed to be about, you know, the whole idea of the Enlightenment and, or at least the, the, the Scottish Enlightenment, you know, which is the one I like, um, <laughs> um, I sort of I'm with Mike Myers when it comes to enlightenment. If it's not Scottish, it's crap. Um, but um, the it's supposed to be about arguments. It's supposed to be about the power of the ability of use reason and persuasion to convince people to come to your side. That's what politics is supposed to be about. Going back to Aristotle is this idea of persuasion. And one of the reasons why I think we're in the mess these days is in such a mess these days. And this is something I, I know happens on the left, but I've, I'm much closer to it on the right. Um, because I live in those, you know, that ecosystem is that you can make a pretty good living talking to audiences that already agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and speak to the choirs. Is the yeah. Thing. And, uh, but it's, so, it's so much fun. They all smile at you and they tell you how great you are. And you don't achieve anything except a momentary bliss for you and the audience. But um, yeah. But you also tempting. convince the audience that purity is the highest ideal, not persuasion, which is not politics. It's populism. Right. It's radical commitment to a single principle. And you get this this thing where politicians have the same problem, particularly on the right, where they just talk to audiences that reinforce their most extreme positions and politicians and, and pundits, particularly younger than me on the right. Um, they don't care anymore about persuading people on the other side to change their mind. And that in a political sense is the essence of tribalism. It's just it's just, it's just a hammer and tongs fight. It's no longer about democracy. It's no longer about persuasion. And that's a real dangerous problem. So I'm going to come back to this question I asked earlier. Why is that? That, that, that's a, that was a problem in 1789. It's a problem in 1850. It's a problem in 1970. Why, why is it somehow – why is it rearing its head today in a yeah. way that it didn't in – I mean I, I'm a, I'm more of a libertarian than you are, but we're, we're both – we both are, and I'm older than you, so you know most of my adult life and a good chunk of yours, you're on the wrong side. <laughs> you're, you're just yeah. losing. Your ideas don't don't have a chance, and you live with it. And it, you know, you wish there's a trend. In my case, the trend is government's getting bigger, and I wish it weren't. But when I have to be honest with myself, I have to admit that it's true that government's bigger than it was in say 1972 when I was 18 years old. But America is a pretty great place, and I think mm -hmm. the numbers are are much better than than people say about how the middle class is doing and poor people are doing. I think I think we're immensely more prosperous, not just the top one percent, not just the top twenty percent, not just the top half than we were then. So all that regulation and all that growth of government that that my side's been worried about turned out pretty well. Uh, I wish it could be better. But it's pretty good. I think it's actually worse for poor people. I think they have fewer chances to flourish and express themselves because of those regulations, because of the size of government. I don't think government helps them. I think it actually hurts them. 
but reasonable people disagree with me, and that's, I'm okay with that. But why all of a sudden does it seem not just, well, I'm losing as always, but now it's not just that I'm losing. It's that maybe the very fundamentals of the system are at risk. How do we get here in yeah. the last well, 40 years? In other words, sure, there's a sort of – I'll say it this way. Through most of my lifetime, the interventionists, the, the top-down folks have had the moral high ground. My side's been losing the moral high ground forever, uh, those, of, those of us who are classical liberals. So it's still true. It was true then. It's true now. But now it seems like something else is, is going off the rails. And if that's true, which I think you agree, why? What, why now? What happened? Yeah. I mean, um, I, again, I think the erosion of civil society is a big part of it. I personally like I, – I, I'm, I'm personally pretty invested in – um, the the plus side of of immigration, but as, as George Borjas said on this podcast, you know there are social consequences that come with it. That simply because of a libertarian or a sort of patriotic bent are unpleasant to hear doesn't change the fact that it's true that large numbers of of immigrants all around the world help fuel populist backlashes because in, including things like Brexit. And the data is like pretty settled on this because people feel like they're losing a sense of belonging in their own community. And so populism is um, – uh, or, or immigration is a big driver of some of this. But at, at, the, at the top level, um, part of the problem is the founders never would have dreamed. You know, this is where – and this is just baffling to me because the whole thing – we were talking earlier about how the founders thought about – we're concerned about concentrated power, or arbitrary power, and that you know power needed to be channeled and used in proper ways and even kept from the majority because the majority with power could be just as dangerous as a minority with power um, or uh, you know, with arbitrary power. The, the founders never would have dreamed that the branches of government wouldn't be jealous guardians of their own power. I am so disgusted with so much of Congress – which, you know, like this uh, – recently there was this thing where um, Jeff Sessions floated the idea that he might not – this is the attorney general – floated the idea that he might not uh, continue the Obama administration policy of looking the other way on marijuana in the states. Again, this is not a point about public policy. Whatever you think about the pot thing, that's different. You had congressmen freaking out, screaming that, no, 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 the, the, the executive branch has to restore this executive order. And they were talking as if legislators had no power to write laws of right. any kind. They all want to be pundits. They all want their spot on Morning Joe or Fox and Friends. They want to opine rather than actually do the work of legislating. And the same thing goes for the executive branch. I mean, one of the things I actually like about Trump, even though it may, I may not like the motives for it, is he's trying to give all this stuff back to Congress. But Congress doesn't they want don't it. Want it no. And meanwhile, the judges, they want to be like the executive branch or the legislative branch, but they don't want to be like the judicial branch. And there's this fascinating sort of breakdown about the constitutional structure where no one no one could have anticipated the idea that political leaders wouldn't want to, you know, get as much power and hold on to their rightful power as possible. That that is part of the problem. And I think a part of it is the corruption of television and mass media. Where these guys know they can keep their jobs by having a better media campaign than writing good legislation. And I don't know how you fix that, but that seems to be a big part of it. Yeah, we're, we're, we're getting near the end of our conversation. I want to I want to change shift gears radically away from this for a minute. What we've been talking about, because I think I want to I want to get your comment on this. You say something very, I think, profound. And at one point you say. Capitalism cannot provide meaning, spirituality, or sense of belonging. Those things are upstream of capitalism. And um, well, first elaborate on that. What do you mean by that? Um, I think capitalism, and I think we mean by capitalism the same thing, free market, liberal democracy. You know, like the, the capitalism is this, has too much negative connotation, but it's the word we have. Um, capitalism is the greatest cooperative – system for maximizing prosperity and peace ever conceived of. It just has one drawback. It well, does, the, not conceived of, actually. That, that right, we that, that's ever emerged. <laughs> right, right. Um, it doesn't feel like it. It's like ivory soap. It's 99 and 44 one hundredths percent pure. 
Um, and I'm a big fan of the eye pencil Leonard Reed stuff and, um, the cooperation that goes into making a pencil is mind boggling, but it's so seamless and invisible. It doesn't feel like cooperation. Yep. And cooperation is much more a, um, hands-on, uh, grassroots, uh, close to the ground thing. And we get meaning in our lives from the people around us, the institutions that we're part of. Um, and, uh, capitalism, capitalism can provide opportunities for that, but capitalism itself can't, there's nothing in it that, you know, fills the holes in one soul. Um, what fills the holes in your soul are family, faith, friends, experience, um, making a meaningful contribution, this notion of earned success. Those are the things that make you feel like you had a, a life well lived Capitalism is great because it provides more or can provide more opportunities to find that niche in the ecosystem that gives you meaning than other systems can. But the capitalism itself isn't doing it. It's it's these other things. And um, as people retreat from those things, um, they start looking to uh, create political systems that they think will be substitutes for that. And the problem is, is it's fool's gold. The, the, the socialism can't do that. Communism can't do that. Capitalism can't do that. Um, the only things that can fill the hole in your soul are in the are basically in the microcosm, not in the macrocosm. So the left's response, I think, to that one of the responses they would say is that uh, you're you're romanticizing capitalism. In fact, it's it's a dreary system that grinds down the worker. It grinds down the poor. It it enables uh, the wealthy and powerful to lead pleasant lives at the expense of others by exploiting them. So they would argue it's not upstream of capitalism. Capitalism is the problem. How would you respond to that? Uh, I mean, a lot of different ways, um, at least some of the same ways I think you would. Uh, one is, is that, um, you know, if capitalism- the host, I get to ask the questions. I don't I, have to answer them. It's a fantastic I, uh, gig. I think it's fair. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, well, first of all, if capital, I mean, first of all, there's all sorts of empirical ways to answer it, which is, you know, insofar as if capitalism is inherently exploitative or exploiting of people, um, why has the amount of leisure time that everybody enjoys continually risen? Um, you know, the, uh, why does, why are child labor laws, you know, lagging rather than leading indicators about the end of child labor? Um, why has it, why was it in capitalist countries that we saw, you know, everything from the end of slavery to the rise of civil rights, the rise of feminism and all of these kinds of things. Um, capitalism allows for all of that kind of stuff. It also just simply allows people more options to choose the kind of life that they want to live. The problem is, is that um, it's still you still need other, you know, other mediating institutions to fill the void. And this is where Schumpeter, I think, plays an important role. Capitalism, capitalism is a problem in the sense that, is, at least in, in Schumpeter's telling, that capitalism is relentlessly rational and it provides no, ex, what he calls, you know, extra rational meaning or substance. That has to come from someplace else. And uh, the family plays an enormously important role in that. That gives, you know, the family is the first institution of civilization because it's the one that explains to children their place in the universe. You know, Hannah Arendt has this great line where she says, every generation, Western civilization is invaded by barbarians. We call them children. And that's true. And families are the first line of defense against the barbarian invasion. They civilize babies into human beings and, and then citizens. And, and then schools play that function and local community organizations play that function. And if they fail, the state can't fix them and neither can capitalism. And one of the things that those those kids who are not properly socialized, and this goes for, for rich people too. I mean, rich people are a bigger part of the problem in my telling than poor people are in terms of antipathy to capitalism. Um, they will have a, they'll be filled with a sense of ingratitude about what came before them. And they will start um, making arguments, you know, in the McCloskey sense, they will start marshalling words. This is a, something that Schumpeter got from Nietzsche in the genealogy of morals is this idea that, Basically, the priests will come forward, and the priests had no real power in olden days, but they had words, and they had arguments. And what they would do is they would make all those things that were once considered virtuous 
into vices. And that's what a lot of the sort of idea merchants of today do, where they say getting rich is evil, where they say democracy is a problem, where they say freedom is a problem, where they say that the story of America is a problem, that we shouldn't be proud of America, we should reject it. Um, that's why you get identity politics the way that we do. And, and to a large extent, that's why the right is surrendering to identity politics, which breaks my heart. Um, and uh, this is... the. the and the only solution to these problems is to – or to those arguments is to come back with better arguments and not just at the level of college debates but in, in your own family and in your own communities. Um, explain to people why they should be grateful that they're born into this age. I mean I have, I have my problems with um, uh, the veil of ignorance, the the, the, it's John the Rawls. Rawls. Yeah. Right? Um, I have some problems with it. But as Barack, and again, I find it strange. I'm agreeing with Barack Obama a lot on this. But um, you know, Barack Obama basically used a Rawlsian argument, said that if you were going to pick any time in all of human history to be born, you didn't know if you're going to be black or white or gay or straight or male or, or female, poor. rich or poor, you'd want to be born right now, and you probably want to be born in America. And um, I think that's true. But we don't teach people that. We don't teach them to be grateful for the moment that they're born in, and we don't teach them to be grateful for the sacrifices that created this, this glorious country and this glorious way of life um, in the first place. Instead, we have an entire industry dedicated to resenting what we have. And I think that's, a, that's the real threat. That's, um, let me just try to respond to that because um, it stimulates a lot of thinking. I, the libertarian in me, I'm, you're a conservative. I think I'm more libertarian than you are. Pretty sure. Yeah, but I'm moving in your direction more than you're moving in mine. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm not sure actually. I, I find myself pulling in uh, in all kinds of directions these days. Um, the libertarian me says, you know, a lot of these trends and a lot of the problem we have about the holes in the soul come from cultural forces that are hard to well can't be controlled. Many of which have an ups a huge upside, which are the celebration of the individual, the celebration of of uh, the pursuit of happiness, and the left, the left, the libertarian part of the left celebrates that. It says you should be free to enjoy yourself. We need to get rid of these these stigmas around uh, various cultural issues, and um, there have been many beautiful and wonderful things about that. Uh, one of the consequences of that, though, has been, I think, very close to the death of the family. Not the death, but it's in its it's very ill. Um, I just looked up a piece of data the other day because it I, you hear all the time you need two incomes to make it to make ends meet in America now. Uh, between 1980 and 2014, the number of, of households with two or more earners fell. That's despite the fact that. Labor force participation women continue to rise over that most of that period. And the reason it fell is because people just aren't getting married as much. Mm -hmm. um, they're more likely to live alone. Uh, we're more likely to pursue our own happiness and not give it up for the for our family, give it up for sustain a marriage that's that's failing or mediocre. We look for something better. And there's some there's a beautiful upside of that. And the downside is is that most people don't a lot of people feel like suckers staying in a marriage that is not exciting, disappointing, whatever it is. The children, whether the children pay a price for it or not, social science debates, but the the civil society institutions whose loss you decry and whose loss saddens me as well or whose diminution, diminution, I don't even know how to pronounce it. Uh, you and I <laughs> erosion. Both, erosion. Decline. You I, decline. You <laughs> and I both decry those. But they're partly the result of, of factors that have led to many good things. Mm -hmm. And the question is whether, for me, the you know, it's it's easy to fall into this paranoia that runs through your book and runs through my head, which is, uh, yeah, it, it, maybe the whole thing's going to come tumbling down. It's not just, oh, it's not going to be as good as I liked. The whole, what I would call the American experiment, the this confluence of, of free markets and liberal democracy, which is unparalleled in human history. It is the miracle that you talk about, that that's literally at risk. And And if you feel that way, you have to start asking – you know what to do about it, and what you just said is is my natural response as well. And I don't know if it's it's not a very satisfying one because you can't make people believe in God, you can't you can't decree it, 
you can't decree uh, that people should be uh, more respectful of their family because it has societal consequences when it breaks down. Those genies, I don't think we can be put those back in the bottle. Um, those of us who live a, liberal, a religious life can encourage people to explore it. But public policy is not headed in that direction. So when you ask, mm-hmm. what can you do about it? Uh, I'm with you. I'm, my, what I try to do about it is talk about it on Econ Talk, p- teach my kids, uh, encourage other people to teach their kids. Uh, but that's a pretty thin – that's – I don't know if that's going to make it. You know, it's, it's not – it's not – selling that solution is, is – it reminds me of uh, uh, a movie I love called, called uh, Start the Revolution Without Me. Where this one person is trying to stop this mob, he's standing there. So it's a mistake, and the, and the mob is just streaming past it. It's like you and I are standing athwart history, <laughs> saying, "You know, it'd be really good if you, when you raise your kids, to explain to them this is a special time." And yeah, we could write a couple books. You've written a book. I've written some books that, that talk about these issues. Um, we need a lot more people writing books, or it's just going to be um, we're just we're going to be we're going to be awfully lonely. And I don't I don't think it's going to be enough, but. That's all I yeah, can do. That's so I'm doing it. But it's um, I have to be pretty pessimistic about the future in, in this story. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I didn't expect to circle around you on the optimistic side, but um, go for it. Yeah, look, the first of all, you're doing what you can do, and it's not just books, right? It's the Hayek rap video, and it's you know a wonderful loaf, and it's all these great things, and you make your arguments where you can and when you can, and you do what you can. And I always tell people the fight for liberty begins in your own backyard. Yep. Um, and you know the fact that it is um, it is unsatisfying that we don't have a better sort of silver bullet answer for how to fix these things. Well, part of the problem is is that as a sort of libertarian minded conservative or conservative minded libertarian. Um, part of our whole worldview is supposed to be opposed to silver bullet arguments. Yep. yep. We right. Don't look to Washington to fix our problems, but and if Washington is the problem, you got to challenge there. That's, yeah, I, no, that's, that's right. my that's my challenge to my libertarian friends who say don't vote. Politics is a cesspool. Don't don't dirty yourself with it. I'm thinking, yeah, that's I'm all for that, but and I don't want my kids to go into politics. I'd be horrified in general. But if we don't, the other folks are going to. Take charge. Yeah. But, you know, part of it is, is, is um, you know, I, I, I'm one of these believers who thinks, you know, as you, I think you said earlier, you know, you've always been losing in a lot of these arguments, right? And yeah. I think that's okay. You know, I, I, that's, this is, you know, I feel like um, I'm in Roth and, and Godfather too. This is the business we have chosen, yeah. right? And this is a good and glorious thing to be on the right side of this amazing fight, right? I mean, it's sort of a Henry V thing, of we happy few. Yeah, uh, for sure. you know, We're on the side of liberty. We're on the side of the sovereignty of the individual. We're on the side of fighting poverty. And um, we've been given this unbelievable gift of being able to make a fairly nice living making arguments for something that we love and we consider valuable and important. And um, I'm a, I'm a huge opponent, which I wasn't sort of going into this book against all forms of teleology, all arguments about the right side of history. Um, there is no right side of history. There is no teleology. Nothing is foreordained. We got into this world by accident. And the glory of that fact means that we can stay in here if we, if we fight the good fight. And that doesn't necessarily mean Arguments about the you know whether the size of government should be nineteen percent of GDP or twenty four percent of GDP. It has to do with these more fundamental things about what human liberty and human flourishing and human happiness mean and require. And the simple fact that we're outnumbered um, should make it more fun, right? You should be more of a happy warrior because there's nothing like being having a good cause. So long as no one shoots us, right? Yeah, you know, so long as like you know, not the gulag. Sh- as long as we're not in the gulag, yeah, yeah. So. But until then, you know, it, it, it's a pretty great life to be, you know, to make a living, to be being paid to make arguments about protecting this glorious and wonderful miracle. And I think that's a, it's an important thing. Yeah, you could argue this is the ultimate first world problem. I, I'm, I'm exactly pessimistic about the yeah. future while I'm being, <laughs> yeah, compensated. Wildly above my um, my wildest dreams, um, I, I 
when I do get pessimistic, I often think of the Talmud where it says, um, it's not up to you to finish the work, but neither are you free to desist from it. And that's my attitude, right? I'm, 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 right. Do, we do what we can, but it does raise you know, the possibility, and I'm curious if you've thought about this. Um, uh, I think you're a little bit homeless. That's my uh, take on your – as your as a loyal follower of you on Twitter – you feel uh, estranged from the party that may, you may – I'm not a partisan. I've never been – considered myself a Republican or a Democrat or even much of a libertarian as a political party. Uh, but you're a Republican historically, and you don't feel at home there so much right now. Are people talking in your spheres about starting a political party that would be more conservative and less – more traditionally conservative and less populist? I mean people talk about it. I, you know – Richard Hofstetter had the famous line about third parties, which is they're historically they're like bees. They have their effect by stinging and then they die. And um, uh, I would have no problem joining some other party. You're right that I've, I, I've always called myself a Republican by default because it's more Republic, it's more conservative of the two parties. But I always took more pride in calling myself a conservative. And even now we're seeing what it means to be a conservative, you know, being twisted around, which is why I may have to retreat into classical liberal or something and, or, um, it's not a retreat, Jonah, it's a, move forward. It's a step forward. <laughs> well, I, I, I actually, I prefer old wig, which okay. is what both Hayek and Burke called themselves, yeah, but, um, too obscure right um, now. You could try to popular, <laughs> popularize it. A neo wig. Yeah. Um, but, um, uh, I get asked this all the time. I'm, and I'm, am I, are you, am I ideologically homeless? And I'm not ideologically homeless. I'm politically homeless. Yeah. I'm more ideologically grounded than I've ever been. And, um, and this moment has been a really remarkable sort of die marker, um, about like, and people have surprised me on in both directions about people who I always kind of thought were just sort of, um, you know, essentially political entertainers, um, who have proven to actually be, um, full of principle and conviction. And there are people who I thought were over brimming, perhaps too much with some principle and conviction who turned out that it was more of a shtick. Mm-hmm. And, um, that it's been an important lesson. And, um, but I'm, you know, my attitude towards practical politics, I mean, I got to write about it cause I'm a syndicated columnist and all that kind of stuff. I don't actually like getting to know politicians. Um, my attitude towards them is a lot like research scientists towards their lab animals. Uh, you, you know, you don't want to get too attached and you certainly don't want to give them names, right? Cause it's much easier to stick yep. a needle in test subject 14 B than it is fluffy. Yep. Um, and, uh, and I, I feel that tangibly when I get to know politicians and become friendly with them, that's corrupting, right? I mean, that's getting back to human nature. Yep. Friendship is in the macrocosm is inherently corrupting. And, you know, my dad always used to say, that um, the most corrupting thing in journalism, my dad was in the journalism business, um, wasn't money. It was friendship. You know, if a friend called you and asked for a favor, it was very hard to say no. If a stranger called you and offered you $10,000 to do something that violated your morals, you say, get the hell out of here. And, um, and, and so one of, the, one of the things I feel tangibly every day in all of this is people, and, I, I, and I'm guilty of it too, where I take these the, the the power the corrupting or the, the the malign effect of this political moment where people are changing their positions I take it personally and I should, probably shouldn't and I feel you know I've lost some friendships and I see friends taking my position and taking it personally and um, that's been hard to sort of separate the wheat from the chaff intellectually about um, but I mean I don't and it's a bit of a digression but I, I, I I'm not interested in like forming a party. Um, if a party that has a chance of doing something positive started to form, I would probably write about it positively. Um, but that's not, it's not my gig. You know, I, I, I'm too close to politicians as it is. I don't want to act like one. Yeah, no, it's a big, it's a, it's a big challenge, I think, because, um, it's like, I don't like these teams, but that team's a good team. That's a good one. I'm going to be on that one. And it does, um, that I think one of the lessons I think of, of this world we're in, and I encourage all listeners to to be aware of this, is how tribal we are, and to see it, see if you can be uh, find that Adam Smith impartial spectator to see it in yourself. 
uh, in our eagerness to see our team. And, you know, I, I love it when people complain about an Econ Talk episode. And I often it's because they just didn't like the politics or the ideology of the yeah. person. It had nothing to do with whether it was good or not. But they You'll just – You'll get some of that on this one. Uh, I we, I, we might. Yeah. <laughs> that was a waste of time. Well, I, and you, yeah. and I also – I'll get criticized for agreeing with you so much. Um, so I apologize to listeners who expect me to give you a, a harder time. I yeah. I do. Find, I am very sympathetic to a lot of the arguments, which made this a different, a different, more of a conversation and less of a challenging set of questions. But we're going way over time. But I want to ask one more question, if if you still okay. have a minute. Yeah. Which is, uh, you're some. You maybe are a little. You said you were going to circle around me on optimism. Your book is called "The Suicide of the West," and I I want to give you a blessing that your book be as successful as the road to serfdom, in the sense that. You know, Hayek gets made fun of because he said we were on the road to serfdom, and we didn't. We didn't go to serfdom. We fought right. it off. And I say, well, that's because the whole point of the book was a warning. Right. And I see your book not as, well, the West is killing itself. It's over. I see your book as saying it, there's still time. Uh, we can pull back, but we're we're heading down a path that's uh, going to end some of the glorious things that have made life worth living for so many people. So um, talk about why you chose that title and, 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 and your optimism. That'd be a great yeah, way to end. So, so um, the working title, I had two working titles for this. Originally, the proposal was wealth. And the idea was sort of to be a, to ping off of Piketty with capital. And then as the argument developed, I changed it to the tribe of liberty. Because what I wanted to argue was that we needed to cultivate a tribal attachment to these principles. And we know that can happen because it happened in England. Yeah. Right. And then uh, America took America. that sort of. Well, yeah, but my bar, my argument would be that America sort of it's sort of the roughly analogous to Jews and Christians in that Jews create monotheism. They create all of these ideas about the innate dignity of the individual, including the including women. Um, but it's still basically a tribal religion for one people. Christianity takes those principles and universalizes them. And um, or at least some of those principles and universalizes them. the British. They came up. They they came up with their through the Glorious Revolution and all that um, and the Magna Carta. Uh, they kind of it was a weird, quirky thing about British, about English culture that made them think a man's home is his castle um, that made them suspicious of centralized authority. And that comes from the fact that they were an island and all of these other things. And then America takes that sort of cultural understanding of things and puts it into a centrifuge and turns and distills it into principle. And so while Locke in his, you know, essays on religion still says Catholics can't be citizens because they're evil and untrustworthy. And Jefferson takes the form of Locke's argument about that, about toleration and refines it to the point where he says, no, everybody, atheists, pagans, they can all be good citizens in society. And I think so. What America did was it took this tribal sense and wrote it down and made it into an abstraction as well and then cultivated it both as an abstraction and as a tribal thing. And I think that would be a really great thing for our country to get back into. It would require not thinking that assimilation is a bad word. It would require all sorts of things that are hard political projects, but they're worthy projects. Um, and so the point of the title, Suicide of the West, which I will confess here is a bit of a negotiated title with uh, the publisher. Um, uh, and I, one of my one of my great objections was, um, you know, this was James Burnham's title. Um, and, you know, my argument is somewhat consistent with Burnham, at least from managerial revolution and all that. And I'm already getting grief from some people. You stole his title. Well, truth is, you can't steal titles. Can't steal titles and he'd be happy. <laughs> yeah, no, he would agree with the book. And um, I'm, I'm breathing new life into James Burnham. He's I, not I, like a household word even uh, – uh, yeah, so. And so the the reason I chose – we, you know, the publisher liked the idea of decline or the fall and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, that's not the point, right? You know, I'm not Oswald Spengler. Um, I'm not – and I'm not Marx. I'm not saying that it's inevitable that the West falls. Suicide's a choice, Right. And so T.S. Uh, T.S. Eliot has this famous line where he says there's no such thing as lost causes because there's no such thing as truly won causes. As long as there are people in the fight fighting for something that's worthy, then the fight's not over. And, um, you know, decline, suicide, these things are 
choices that I agree with you. Societies as an entity doesn't make a decision, but decisions are there are decisions that are made on a collective basis. They're made through institutions that collectively turn into pretty similar to a society wide decision and they can be reversed. And, and so the, the hope in the book, you know, the, I pin a lot on just cultivating the sense of gratitude for what we've got. You know, everyone wants to say that the story of the goose that lays the golden egg is, a, is the moral of the story is greed and, and greed's in there. But the real story there, particularly if you look at the different versions of it that come from France and England is ingratitude. I mean, this, this bird waddles into your house and starts laying golden eggs and, and people demand in one version of it, the guy demands that it lay two. And when it politely says, I can't do that, he kills it. You know, I mean, that is the essence of ingratitude. And I, I you know, it's basically, you know, basically just an argument for saying, let's stop looking at the downside of everything and look at how much better off we are than we have been at any other time in human history, how, this nostalgia for the past is nostalgia for bad dentistry and bad food and rampant disease and low life expectancies. And instead, you know, let's let's look at what's good about this and then build with our gratitude for what is good about how to make things better. And I think that's I mean, it's, I agree. Suicide of the West sounds dour, but it's actually a pretty it, it's the kind of it's kind of I've never thought about this before, but it's kind of the talk I would want to give to somebody who was suicidal. Look at how much you have to live for. Look how great things have been for you. Don't let this get you so down that you give up. And that is sort of the point of the, of the title and why I think optimism is required because optimism is infectious and, and going through life, being able to be happy in what you espouse and what you fight for um, is an incredible gift and you should be, you should be thankful for it. My guest today has been Jonah Goldberg. Jonah, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. It was a great honor. Love to be here. Thank you. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.